Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, special presentation for the board, the board of Commissioners on the COVID-19 planning and potential impact of that virus. And what I'd like to do today is uh, those who will enable, please stand. We'll have a moment of silence, and then I'll have the officer leave some pledges of allegiance. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Hosack, I believe you have the floor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Board. Um, wanted to provide uh, the Board um, just some basic, uh, an overview of what we're going to be presenting this afternoon to the commissioners. Um, the purpose of this update is to make sure the Board's aware of all of staff's uh, current efforts uh, and planning exercises, uh, first and foremost, to ensure the safety of our 5,000-plus uh, employees as well as our 760,000-plus uh, citizens here in the county. We take that very seriously, as does the Board of Commissioners. Um, but we also know that we need to make sure that while we take these efforts to make sure that we keep everybody safe in accordance with recommended guidelines, that we also make sure that we are maintaining uh, county services and essential county services to keep us in business. Um, we will provide you an update um, from specific departments this afternoon um, and then kind of finish up with some general recommended guidelines for how we plan to move forward. Um, we did want to stress that right now um, these particular recommended guidelines have been developed um, specific to or uh, with the authority that we have over Board of Commissioner controlled departments um, but we are certainly encouraging and sharing our efforts with the other elected officials um, and are stand ready to assist them in implementing these for their particular operations as uh, their needs may dictate. Um, finally, um, we're going to finish up with some HR policies that we feel like we do need to get in front of the board this afternoon for adoption that will help us uh, accomplish the general guidelines and recommendations that we'll finish up with, uh, with the board. And um, what I'd like to do very quickly is, um, one, congratulate uh, Dr. Jackie McMorris. Um, she was selected to lead an internal task force uh, that began these efforts probably about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, and I'm going to ask her to kind of give you some specifics on how we've uh, proceeded with our internal task force and how we move forward. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Mr. County Manager, Chairman, Commissioners. On March the 9th, an internal task force was established so that we could do two things primarily. One, to ensure that all of our county departments would have an avenue to share feedback and to address employee and citizens' concerns in the manner in which we share information. So we wanted to be able to efficiently provide updates in a seamless and proficient manner. So that was the purpose of the internal task force. This internal task force is comprised of about 30, 35 people to include our agency directors, the courts, elected officials, public safety, and representatives from the county manager's office. We were meeting daily at 1030 as a touch point. And for those who could not come, thanks to Sharon and IS, we created WebEx. And we also had social media types of platforms in which we could communicate with people, including group me, to let them know real quick updates to what was going on, as this has been a fast developing type of situation that we've been in. The task force will stay in place until further notice, and we are continuing to keep them apprised of things that you all will be deciding on today. So we've asked them, those who cannot be here, to stream this particular meeting so that they can stay apprised of what's going on. 
So what we want to do today real quickly is to ask several departments to bring you up to speed on some of the concerns that they have faced, most of which you are aware of via email, and to share with you some of the recommendations in dealing with some of the issues that have arisen as a result of the coronavirus. At this time, I would like to start with public safety and ask Director Kreider if he would come forward and share from that department, of which on your PowerPoint presentation, we will follow the departments that are listed on your screen. Good afternoon, commissioners, uh, county manager. First of all, I uh, want to tell you from the onset of uh, these activities, we've implemented the National Incident Management System Framework, known better known as NIMS. Uh, and as we move forward, uh, we're continuing to implement ongoing uh, pandemic disease containment and control strategies. Next. And we've actually created an overall county incident action plan. This incident action plan will be updated as we move forward uh, through the next, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, short duration of weeks, maybe months to come. Uh, but initially, where we have our focus uh, is in some areas of minimizing public and county employee exposure to the uh, COVID-19. And we're doing that by, first of all, determining which countywide departments should continue their normal operations. We're looking at monitoring the situation and uh, taking guidance from the CDC, the Georgia Department of Public Health, and Cobb Douglas Public Health. Uh, and then we're, uh, as of today, we're going to be reviewing, updating, and training on hopefully some new policies that will come before you later today. Our second main goal is to maintain critical infrastructure and essential services. Uh, we have been, as uh, Dr. McMorris said, been working with our elected officials, our county manager, agency directors, and all of our department heads to determine uh, our essential services. Uh, and then we also want to uh, explore the idea of having some of our essential employees telework from home. Um, we're monitoring staffing levels, obviously, due to the potential exposures of our employees and also the, for uh, schools being closed, uh, our staffing levels obviously can be uh, impacted by this. Uh, we're coordinating with the local, state, federal agencies to identify and acquire needed resources. Uh, you'll see in just a few moments where uh, members of the fire department have reached out to all of public safety agencies within Cobb to try to identify resources that uh, we're gonna be needing moving forward. And then uh, we also are coordinating with local, state, federal agencies to provide needed assistance. And in most of these cases, we're just playing a, a support role uh, because uh, we have the subject matter experts that uh, we're following their direction and providing support as needed. And then obviously we want to anticipate economic and social disruption. The third main topic, if you will turn that, is to provide for communication technologies and protocols, obviously through events like this, we know how important communication is and we know how important accurate, updated, and uh, uh, good communication, what it does to our employees and to our citizens. Uh, we want to continue public and media relations involving all of our county stakeholders, and that's from our elected officials uh, through our cities, uh, everyone, all those stakeholders within the county. We're obviously a few years back, uh, we developed uh, some business continuity plans uh, throughout all of the departments throughout the county, uh, and we have uh, now uh, implemented all of those, and each of our departments are working through those uh, continuity of operations. We want to identify and document direct and indirect costs. Obviously, there's going to be some costs that we take on as a result of what we're experiencing, uh, and working with uh, Cassie and our EMA, uh, we're making sure that we're documenting all of this so that uh, we can put together a plan uh, after action uh, report uh, at the conclusion of this event. We want to identify and monitor metrics and milestones and timelines. Uh, obviously, we want to maintain appropriate FEMA documentation. This incident action plan will review, be reviewed every 12 hours, uh, and a situational status report will be communicated as needed. And then as we move forward with our new plans, as we finalize them, we implement them, we will review them periodically. Now I want to just tell you a few things that, uh, before I go to the individual departments, we've had a lot of people uh, talk about what, what is the route that I take uh, if I think that I, I've uh, got the virus and I need to be tested. Well, I'm going to talk about that. First of all, let's look at the symptoms. Obviously, uh, most of us now are aware of what the major symptoms are, but if you're in close contact with someone with the virus and develop the symptoms, call your health care provider. 
uh, and tell them about your symptoms and your exposure, they will be the ones to decide whether you need to be tested. We've had a lot of people calling our public safety departments uh, asking, where can I get tested? How do I go about getting tested? Uh, and so I wanted to provide that guidance. And then uh, over the weekend, Dr. Meemark put out this statement that Cobb Douglas Public Health, along with our county partners, are going to assure everyone that we're working tirelessly to protect your health and well-being. And it gives these websites uh, that we all can visit to get up-to-date, accurate information. Uh, and those uh, websites are available to give you that information. And hopefully everything's there that you need. Excuse me. Now let's uh, talk excuse, about. Excuse me, Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, for that fifth bullet. Uh-huh. If someone is uninsured, who is their first point of contact? If someone is what? Is uninsured. One eight six six public health. Pub health. I'm sorry. P U B H L T H. P U B pub health. P U B H L T H. H L T H. Okay. Now we'll talk about the, the department specific within public safety and what we've been doing and what, where we're going. First of all, there's been a, a several cancellations. You can see them on the board and for obvious reasons uh, where meetings or events were taking place that were gonna uh, bring large numbers of people together. You can see some of those. We always, we always host the Metro Atlanta EMS conference where there's about 600 participants. We've canceled that. Uh, our award ceremony, our lieutenant and engineer's promotional assessment process where we had assessors flying in from out of state and for obvious reasons we canceled those. All of the events that we uh, interact with the school system we've canceled. Um, we've uh, altered our response techniques on EMS calls obviously through the CDC recommendations. Uh, you see the second bullet there what we've communicated to our responders. Uh, we work with 911 dispatch on removing uh, some of our fire response from general weakness calls that may be ambulance only. Uh, we're trying to limit exposure as much as we can to those calls and remain in service to answer those uh, more serious calls. Uh, and then we've also removed uh, the police department response from most of our medical calls. Typically a police officer would be dispatched with fire on medical calls. We still are sending them on calls where they're needed, whether it be a a homicide, obviously, or the calls where a police officer is needed, but uh, the general medical calls, they're no longer responding to those. Next. Um, we've coordinated with public safety agencies throughout Cobb County to identify their resource needs. Uh, we are partners with all of our public safety departments throughout the county, our cities, uh, trying to get an um, idea of what their resource needs are so that when those resources become available, we can place those orders. Um, we are continuing to work on a closed pod, uh, and that means a point of distribution. And let me just make sure that everyone knows that uh, that will not be up and running for our public safety until a, um, a um, vaccine. vaccine. Thank you, Lisa. Until a vaccine is uh, created. And so, but we, uh, we have that uh, uh, in the works and working on that. We're monitoring staff levels, like I said, because of school closures. We upgrade our PPL uh, E levels. Five um, of our Randy, employees. Hold on, who Randy, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, you talked about the schools. Obviously, with the schools being closed, the uh, the schools have their own police force. Have we talked to them at all? Like, if we kind of run short of potentially bringing them in? Well, we've got. Uh, we have not. We can reach out to them, but uh, once I get to the police uh, department, we'll talk about staffing levels. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. Director, what does that mean you monitor staff levels as a result of those uh, who may be impacted by school closures? Do Child care. Do employees feel comfortable in, in being able to provide pro proper care for their children at this time? And to be honest, I'm quite, con I'm a, this is a broader concern beyond fire, but uh, many families like mine have children who are home right now, who, mm -hmm. are, who are not in school and employees are here today saying we're monitoring it that does not let me know what is specifically done so those employees know that they can provide adequate care for their children 
No, no. When I, when I say monitoring, I'm talking about if we have a number of our employees who have to stay home with their children to take care of their children, mm -hmm. what does that do to our ability to provide okay. services? So and, and that's so really where my question came from. Sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm done. done. So, so you're telling me that employees within FIRE feel like they have latitude to be able to be home with their children at this time if they need to? Sure. Okay. Sure. And that's been communicated? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, all of our employees, we, we know that there are child care issues uh, and we're accommodating those because of, we have very large departments, fortunately, where hopefully we can uh, close down certain divisions that may not be an immediate direct response to 911 calls. And we're pulling some of those resources in to ride on our fire trucks, cover a beat, so on and so okay. forth. Thank okay, thank you. No, I was just commenting that that's why I brought up the uh, school police because that's an additional source of sure. police officers to help fill in for the, exactly what we're talking about. And if that works out, a lot of those school police are former Cobb County officers. So, <laughs> so uh, we did have five of our uh, firefighters who were out, uh, but they're back at work today. Unfortunately, we had three others over the weekend who've uh, been sent home uh, to be quarantined. And then obviously uh, when we go on those calls with someone who we suspect may have the virus, uh, we follow up with the hospitals to, once that is confirmed, uh, we go back and see who those responders were who responded to that particular call and that's how we're able to identify those that may have been exposed. Uh, and then obviously we're following our current uh, county travel training guidelines. On the police side, uh, they've taken some measures to limit exposure as well. Uh, many calls that they can handle by, via telephone, uh, they're gonna take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, their squad meetings are virtual meetings so that uh, it don't bring a number of those police officers in off the street with unknowingly being exposed to the virus. Uh, again, they're responding to fewer EMS calls. Uh, and then should a precinct suffer, Commissioner Ott, this is what, uh, addresses your question, should a precinct suffer from reduction in staffing, uh, we're looking at the specialty units that uh, are already canceling some of their obligations that we can bring them into a beat if necessary. Okay. We're also uh, looking at developing a plan to go to 12 hour shifts uh, in P PD if uh, the need arises. Uh, we're preparing for that. Hopefully we don't get to that point. They also are considering teleworking for essential non-sworn staff and then annual training and firearms training, uh, some of that is being postponed. And then they've also canceled the faith forum that was scheduled for later this month. Our 911's communications, uh, they've played a critical role in uh, preparing our responders to anticipate what they're responding to. Uh, a lot of the information that they're gathering and screening these calls and relaying that information to our responders is huge. Uh, and they're doing a good job in that. They're flagging addresses where uh, there's been confirmed or presumptive uh, cases uh, to reduce uh, first responder exposure. Next. They've provided VPN access uh, with uh, 911 has some special VPN licensing uh, licenses that uh, their dispatchers can work, uh, uh, can telework as well. Uh, they're looking at uh, compiling a list of employees that can come in should they have uh, staff shortages. And they're using their backup center in conjunction with their primary dispatch center to uh, provide that social dist distancing. They've postponed all tours and visitors to the 911 center. They've rest restricted police and fire animal services personnel access to the center. Uh, vendors, contractors, unless it's necessarily business only, uh, they've canceled the ability for people to tour the facility and then they also have postponed their annual awards. And then finally, our EMA, uh, which is playing obviously a, a critical role in this event. They're tracking, tracking and documenting countywide significant events, expenses, planning efforts related to the virus. Uh, they've developed incident resp response plans and best practices as relayed by federal, state, and local health officials. Uh, here again, we're reviewing our business continuity plans, our continuity of operation plans uh, to ensure that each of our departments has uh, everything that it needs to meet uh, the objectives and remain consistent. Uh, we've distributed the pandemic annex to all of our county partners that they're operating by now. 
uh, and then they reviewed the pandemic action items with all the BOC departments and the judiciary, and that plays into the task force that Dr. McMorris is chairing. And then our last slide uh, is that EMA has been the liaison between county departments and public health for health concerns and best practices. Uh, EMA has also been f facilitating that communication that we talked about earlier to our all of our county depart departments and our community partners. And then uh, they're ensuring that the EOC is operational and functioning at a level two monitoring. And then finally, we're utilizing Web EOC to track all of these events, which is most critical uh, when it comes to reimbursement uh, and uh, getting back to a, a norm when all of this is over. So with that, uh, I'll entertain any questions that you may have focused strictly at public safety. How are you, how are you being able to flag uh, people that have the virus or, or are presumptive have it? How, how, where are you getting that information from? We, we're getting it from the hospitals. That's what that slide spoke about. That's how we identify which of our responders actually went on that call. We're communicating that with the hospital. If that hospital knows that that's a county resident, then they're reaching out to us, letting us know that that person has tested positive. We go back through our records management system, who was, see who was on that call, and we have a record of that. Okay, thanks. Um, along the same lines, Randy, I know that in um, listening to how things are done at the airport when people come back from international destinations and when they're, they get the medical screening after going through customs, there was discussion about the fact that it gets entered into a CDC um, system that's supposedly notifying Cobb Douglas Public Health. Um, would it not be also possible to get that information forwarded over to 911? I don't know. I could, we could research that. Well, I mean, my understanding sure. is that if somebody comes in from an international destination, one of the mm -hmm. hotspots, let's just say Germany, right? A, a U.S. citizen, they live in Cobb. They're going to go through customs, sure. And then because they came in from Germany, mm -hmm. they're going to be directed to the secondary screening, where right. they're going to get screened by the contractor that um, HHS has, mm -hmm. and then ultimately um, CDC, and their their information is going to get put into the CDC system, which then is supposed to be sending it to Janet and Lisa's office, so that we, the county, because we're responsible for maintaining. Their quarantine, so it would seem so that. So those people are hey, Jen, Dr. Lee Mark, you come up to the microphone. My my thoughts just are because if, if we have these people that are self quarantined, and let's just say they do indeed have the virus and they get sick, nine one one is going to get the call to send somebody out. Well, we at Public Health already know that they're a potential um, person with an infection. So it would seem to me that it would be good to somehow at least get that address in there because we know what it is. Yeah, so that, that gets a little bit difficult because the patients that or people that are being monitored are being watched for 14 days, right? Um, we don't know if they're gonna develop symptoms. So I understand how it could be an issue for our first responders to respond and not know what the symptoms are, but we're monitoring a lot of people that are just entering it into a computer system. And so we don't really kind of respond until we know that they've popped up symptomatic. Otherwise, they, they're just waiting out their 14 days. Um, so it's hard to go back and, and give them the entire list and connect that list together. But my recommendation would be to, you know, as you go forward, it's you know what's called universal precautions just kind of plan for the patient may be you know we're, we're getting to the point now where you, a lot of people are going to be you know quarantined or they're going to know somebody is quarantined then just take you know essential precautions every time that you go unless it's something like I fell off a ladder but if you have a medical concern then you know just be prepared yeah I mean I only bring it up because we're being told that 911 center is starting to flag people so if they're already starting to flag people why wouldn't we not want to try to use yeah, information that's it out after there? The fact, though, right? So they're getting it after they get tested, and then it's a contact precaution or investigation. So they'll get reached out. Oh, nine one one brought them, and so that's why it's going back to them. It's kind of retroactive in that way. Commissioner Burrell. Uh, stay up there, Doctor Neymar. Doctor Neymar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the HIPAA laws are those requirements still in place, or are they being 
Yeah, so HIPAA laws are still in place right now. We do have a little bit more um, latitude if there's a public health issue that if we need to, like, so if I needed to, you know, call the school or something like that and let them know this is a public health concern and we have a, um, a patient that could affect public health in a bigger audience, then we are able to have some latitude with that, but it's still in place. Definitely for media and things like that, we can't let any of that out. But if there is some sort of emergency or urgency that we need to um, protect the public safety and reveal something to someone who may not be directly taking care of that patient, there is some latitude, but there's, you know, a lot, it's a fine line, though. All right. Thank you. You're Anybody else? Don't go far. <laughs> Commissioner Cupid, yes. Yes, ma'am. So on the general county incident action plan, I, pre I presume that the bullet that this um, provides that it will be determined which countywide departments should continue normal operations, that'll be assessed over each agency, over each department. Yes, that, that's something that I think will be discussed later on today for, through the county manager's office. Oh, okay, so that's still being determined. Yes, ma'am. On a departmental mm -hmm. level, okay. Thank okay, you. thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners. We just wanted to give you an update on what's going on with the Department of Transportation. Um, as you know, our airport division is fairly small, so Carl has already implemented a rotation of work over there with his, his department and his um, employees. Um, one of the things that we're doing in conjunction um, with uh, the Customs and Border Protection is as in international flights come into town, if they're coming to our airport, um, they're required to pre present a 24-hour notification of where they've been. Um, and before they come in 24 hours prior to that, they're, they're contacting our Customs Office before they land. They're providing um, where they've been, point of departures, Restricted countries, that if they've come from restricted countries, that say if it's one of the hot spots, they're directed to another airport. We're not taking those flights into McCullum Parkway, McCullum. Um, so as they're entering, the air, aircraft pilot and passengers have manifestos. They're providing their backgrounds and um, the, any desti destinations that they visited over the, the past 14 days prior to entering um, that airport. And um, they're asked to be to submit to an interview as necessary for health conditions or any type of symptoms that they may have. After they've landed and they've done that, um, aircraft are received by the Customs Border Patrol officer. And then um, if there's any suspicions or questions, then we're um, detected by the Customs Border Patrol officers. Then the CDC, we request their involvement so they can come out and um, investigate and provide recommendations for those passengers. Um, we are implementing U.S. policy at this location, and we're making decisions based on that policy and the information that we're provided and on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. And then we're also Customs Border Patrol guidelines and um, um, standard operating procedures are being updated regularly as more and more information is being presented. Tom, quick question. I know that um, down at the airport, air crews are not having to go through the security or the medical screening that um, the passengers do if they come in from some of the hotspots. Um, and you're, I know that, like you said, any passenger that comes from one of the hotspots has to go to a different airport. But are we checking that the air crews that are coming in there have not been somewhere else? Because um, I know that the ones that are coming into the Hartsfield and you know the 13 airports, they're being kind of monitored just because they're coming into that airport. But you know, I think we need to kind of make sure that the air crews and I, and I can only answer that the CBP is following the guidelines that they have in place. So I don't want to say specifically what CBP is doing and what they're not doing, but they're following their guidelines as necessary. Our particular officer, if there's anything unusual or anything out of the ordinary or related to a hot spot, the CBP officer on staff is calling the supervisors and they're determining how to handle that on a case by case situation. Is that, is that the only slide? On, on the airport. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, no, not so fast. <laughs> okay. So we know that HHS is um, bringing passengers out to McCollum. From I, I'm sorry, I can't. Health, I couldn't health and Human Services, we know they're bringing passengers out to McCollum to be trying to re relocate it back to their states. 
Yes. So my understanding was that when they left California, they had all kinds of people in special suits to monitor them on and off the airplane? Well, it's well, been uh, informed to us that we do have uh, passengers from the cruise ship that were that were uh, stationed at Dobbins for their quarantine period. Right. Um, there have been some flying out on private jets back to their home states. They are all uh, suited up, the passengers themselves appropriately. They are taking their ground transportation directly to the aircraft, and they are boarding the aircraft to depart from the airport on private flights, so they're okay. not exposing the public. All right, okay. Just want to make sure. Thanks. So we'll talk about transit next. So at Complink, we have been working um, hand in hand with guidance from Federal Transit Administration. They've been um, very good about providing information for us and guidelines. So in conjunction with that information and working with our partners at CERTA, MARTA, Gwinnett County, um, we've, we've tried to do a really good job of um, putting together some standards of operations procedures um, at Complink. So we've also been um, heavily in communications with our First Transit, our contractor over there, and they have done a great job of making sure that we have disinfectant and sanitation for the buses um, and meeting specific guidelines that FTA has provided. So it's there's certain, certain types of um, disinfectants that they have on the list that we can utilize to have a, a higher... Um, disinfectant quality for the buses. So we're disinfecting our buses more frequently every afternoon, day when they're, they're fueling up, we're making sure that those buses are getting cleaned and disinfected. Um, and then we're also doing a better job or, or a more frequent job of cleaning where the drivers and dispatch areas congregate. Um, we're cleaning equipment that are high touch areas where there's high foot traffic. We're making sure those are cleaned really well. Uh, multiple times a day also and then we're also um, holding daily bus inspections we have bus inspections but this is just a, a just another precaution to make sure that they're they're getting sprayed down and disinfected um, some of the things that we're doing for the public is um, and for our drivers to make sure everyone is as being as precautious as they can be is we're making sure our operators have gloves and hand sanitizers on the bus um, we're making sure that staff and our contract staff um, have disinfecting wipes for their areas, for um, spray for common areas where you have your printers, copiers, um, phones. We're trying to share information with all of our staff, um, including our contract staff, um, on preventative measures as it's being pushed out from the county, Dr. McMorris. We're sharing all this information with our contractors and our staff, um, preventative measures from the CDC. And then we're providing the um, COVID-19 prevention recommendations for passengers while on board the buses. If you can go to the next slide. For customer engagement, um, we're disinfecting our interior of our facilities more frequently, along with prov providing disinfectant to um, staff. Um, I'm sorry. We're posting flyers. On um, on efforts to minimize passengers' risk to exposure of COVID-19 on the buses, um, at our transfer centers, at our parking rides online and on social media, just trying to get more and more information out for our passengers and our, our drivers. We're directing our passengers online to social media and Coblink mobile apps for service announcements, um, not knowing what could, could not happen. There, there is a potential that if there could be a route that has to be revised or, um, you know, other things that could happen for Comlink, but we're just trying to be very careful and as, as things develop, we'll make sure that information gets pushed out to the public. Um, we're also trying to um, issue news releases on next steps that are being taken by Comlink to minimize exposure to COVID-19. We're holding um, weekly co coordination calls with our regional partners, such as MARTA, Gwinnett, um, CERTA, and then increasing the supply of cleaning products and materials on hand. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that the only facility we really have for Coblink that, that, that um, has a lot of interaction with the public is our paratransit facility. So we're making sure that we're doing um, a good job of keeping all that clean. And um, we're going to really push out information for, for the public that needs to buy breeze cards or media brochures that, you know, a lot of this stuff can be taken care of online. If you, if you can't purchase materials online, you know, you can still come into the office, but we're going to have precautions in place 
so that their welfare and the welfare of our um, employees is, is taken into account. Okay, do you have anything else? Sure. Um, there's a p popularized measure that the CDC has taken for there to be limited interaction or social interaction of people of 50 or above. Mm -hmm. I don't know what type of ridership um, is on some of our buses um, at a given time, but I have a, a lot of concern about the ventilation that's on buses and mm -hmm. just the general sanitation um, beyond just what the, the once a day cleaning and how you're taking each passenger as they come on, not, not knowing um, their health conditions. Have there been any broader guidelines that have been provided for how to address this from a public health perspective? Because my presumption is that our most vulnerable workers, too, mm -hmm. um, are maybe the ones who are, are most dependent on transit. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of concern about those who may be essential employees who are having to work and take our buses. But, I, I mean, the, our public buses just seem to, to be a place where there's... A, just an inherent risk. Mm -hmm. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so part of what we're doing, so yes, we know that a lot of our paratransit riders especially um, have some type of disability or have that, um, not even much so on our paratransit, but just all of our services. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at, as we're waiting on those additional supplies to come in, ways that we can sanitize those vehicles more frequently. So not only is it the disinfectant spray, but just trying to make sure that all of the area seating handles included um, are sanitized and disinfected. Mm -hmm. And also with our contractor, they have measures in place um, to for their employees just to keep the interaction between the passenger and the drivers um, limited. Typically, um, paratransit operators aren't don't have the physical touch um, with the, um, if someone is wheelchair or needs some assistance. Um, so we're trying to limit that, but our contractor does have uh, those guidelines in place. Okay. Is there hand sanitation that's available to bus riders? It is currently not just because of stock. So mm -hmm. we've issued all of our operators with their own individual sanitizer and just as we're able to purchase so not only us, but our contractor um, purchased them. We're trying to put them out on the vehicles um, as we can, but currently not right now. And also with the messaging that we've posted with the flyers, mm -hmm. it's not only what are we doing, but the messaging that CDC Public Health has also issued as what are the recommendations for the general public. So if you have your own sanitizer, bring those. Amazing. So those same type measures. Okay. This, I mean, I, I know there's been... some messaging around discouraging the use of masks, but if anywhere seems to be a place where they, they may be encouraged, I would want to thank those that may be in, in close proximity on our buses. I, I just don't know how. I don't know how yeah, but everything, everything they say, the mask does you no good if you do not have uh, the coronavirus. And mm -hmm. by buying them, they are in short supply for the doctors that need them. Certainly. So that, I don't think again, we need to be encouraging all, people to buy shared. them. Right. Certainly. I, I'm just very concerned that, you know, I'm just making some notes about some things that may still need to be a, 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 um, addressed significantly beyond this meeting. And that's one of them because, again, you know, nobody's testing riders. I went to the hospital the other day. They gave us a test before we even entered in, but nobody's doing that when you um, – to Commissioner Cupid's bus. point, but to yours also, and I apologize for if I mm -hmm. cut you off, but um, we're, we're issuing the gloves just for the, the touching of the surfaces, um, just for that reason, knowing that at least currently right now, the guidance and, and the availability mm -hmm. for that matter. Um, Those of, are for riders, for, for riders or for drivers? Both. Both. Okay. So, well, I'm sorry. The gloves are for the operators. Okay. But we haven't um, issued any masks, one just for availability, but then mm -hmm. also understanding what we've know so far from CDC and public health is that the the or the mass aren't um, aren't good if you are currently mm -hmm. ill and just to leave those for the health sure. workers and the gloves are being encouraged for riders to use in your education I can't recall if that particular one is um, 
if that bullet is on that flyer. It's okay. Gone. Okay. And I'm seeing um, shaking the head. So I, I presume that there isn't a broader public measure by CDC um, on public transportation. So I'm Lisa Crossman from Public Health. So a couple of things. The issue that Bob just mentioned about not wearing masks, ideally the, the use of masks is for the person who is sick, wow. right, to try to decrease that spread of when they cough or when they sneeze yeah. and having that get on other people. There's not the benefit to you and I if we are not sick to be masking Correct. up like before we get on mass transit. So the, the same goes for gloves, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm wearing... Um, latex gloves and I wear those all day long and I've touched this and I've touched this and I've shaken your hand and then I touch my face those gloves are not going to protect me mm -hmm. from transmitting germs even any more than my regular hand okay and so we're not encouraging folks to walk around with latex gloves on in an in, in an effort to protect themselves or others um, those gloves would really be reserved for folks who are in public health or in uh, health care mm -hmm. when they're serving folks or, or for folks who are in environmental set settings and they're cleaning these, these areas. Has the CDC provided any measures regarding public transportation? Commissioner, I haven't seen that, but I also haven't looked directly for bus lines. So um, I've added that to our list to get back in touch. There may be some things where we post on your website and on your buses about not getting on when you have these symptoms. Mm -hmm. That could be one way to help offer a little bit of protection. Yeah. We might want to look at a few masks that the drivers can have if somebody gets on and is, you know, they don't seem to be sick when they first get on, but they start coughing and hacking while they're on the bus. You could give them a mask to put on to protect until they get off. Mm -hmm. I, I just need to have our staff look at some um, of the CDC guidance for CCTs, and I'm sorry we don't have all those answers is there, for you. Um, okay, Lisa, you. in the coronavirus.gov that we talked about last yep. week from the conference call, there is a section on transit. On, on mass yes. transit, okay, so we'll look at that. So corona, in coronavirus.gov, it spells out all the different things, household, businesses, um, transit, and, and I forget there's another one, but there's like four or five different um, areas that it addresses, and the transit was I, one and of that's them. That's part of my reason for asking, because there are some measures that I've read that I'm not seeing addressed, and that I just want to make sure that we are, um, that we're being mindful that just because of the close proximity and the close space within our buses, I, I wasn't trying to go there or necessarily plead ignorance, but just a, a mindfulness that we go and, and make sure that that we're paying particular attention to those that are that are going to be on transit. Yeah. And also just directing people to websites such as the CDC and public health, knowing that what we may, because we want to be consistent in messaging, so we're not pushing out something that's not already there and we're not recreating something. So we've added links to various of our various materials that direct folks to those websites. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we'll talk about our roadway section real quick. Um, so just things that we're doing um, at the main building that focuses just mostly on roadway is we're still just doing our disinfecting for our interior, interior facilities more frequently, um, installing hand sanitation stations. We're cleaning equipment daily, high touch areas. Um, we've asked staff to eliminate as many face-to-face -face meetings as possible and try and utilize WebEx or conference calls um, but to continue businesses as, as much as normal as we can. Um, and then we're following the travel um, training policy. Um, we're sending out daily emails to staff just to providing updates um, along with what Dr. McMorris's office is doing. And then we're asking staff to follow the county's website just for current information to stay informed. Um, we're providing the hand sanitation and um, disinfecting wipes. We're sharing information with staff on preventative measures to minimize exposure, and we're working with our managers to reduce um, contact among staff. So really and truly roadway section, we're still trying to maintain as much normal as we can. Um, our roadway maintenance office is going to continue to work their normal hours um, and continue to, to work, man work orders. Um, our traffic operations group, we're still going to do the same. We're going to um, continue to um, 
work work orders and manage the traffic signals in the county. Uh, we're going to try and rotate or limit hours in the office for maybe our traffic management center, rotate employees in and out of the building so we don't have as many employees in the, in the office at the same time. Um, our utilities group will continue to be in the field and manage um, utility permits. So we're just trying to make sure that we maintain as much normal as possible um, and, and limit as much exposure and keep social distance, distancing as, as far apart as we can. Um, one thing that, that I didn't mention is within our traffic group, this is probably the only thing that may be impacted significantly, is request for traffic studies for signals, um, intersection improvement, anything like that that would require a traffic signal or a traffic study, just because traffic patterns are going to be changing drastically over the next time period, those will be suspended until traffic patterns, school goes back into session and we have normal traffic patterns um, back in, in a, that are back to normal. Okay, thanks, Erica. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, good afternoon, commissioners, chairman, county manager. Uh, before I go into my slides, I do want to say publicly thank you to the Cobb Douglas Public Health Board, uh, Lisa Crossman. We have, with public services, as you can imagine, access to the public with our agencies is a big thing. And uh, in any event, we have a chain of events that connects an employee with an exposure. We have created our own, uh, we've created a decision model that allows us to address it in a uniform manner. And part of that decision model requires guidance from a credible authority. And they have been very accessible uh, in a few events to help us make some good decisions and handle our employee matters in a, in a very quick and appropriate manner. So thank you. And that is a very important part of our systems. Going on to our slides, uh, most of our decisions in public services have looked at our national trendsetters, thought leaders, and governing bodies. You see for parks, uh, as you already know, we've talked offline about some of our decisions regarding our recreational facilities uh, and our sports association. But we were watching these trends. Each agency director was looking at these trends and seeing what was happening in their industries and then basing their decisions on best, best practices. Our parks looked at what the National Sports Association was doing, uh, the precedents they set for social distancing, and uh, libraries, and the UGA Cobb Extension, same chain of thought, closely aligned with the school system, see what they were doing. As, as you notice, our, system, our decision to close, to align with them and support their efforts with social distancing. Um, we've already, you've seen the decision models we've sent to you all by email on what we were doing at each one of those uh, agencies. The elections uh, has a governing body, as you know, a board of elections and also secretary of state. And it's also been some national decisions made on elections. Uh, Janine herself right now is down at the Capitol. I think they have a uh, press conference and some decisions that will be coming out later on what we're doing in terms of elections. But all these things have been affected by this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, senior services, um, as you all know, is the uh, most vulnerable population. So we've made some uh, extra efforts. Uh, Director Gibson has done a great job and following the guidance of the regional and, and national authorities, they've kept abreast of what's going on in their industry. And we've been a little aggressive in um, uh, making decisions regarding what's best for our patrons in that regard. Next slide, please. Current status, as you already know, our parks, I didn't know this myself, close to 500 events a month, anywhere from five to 3,000. We've already canceled um, some of these major events, you all are aware of this. Uh, we have drawn a line with rental facilities, renting our facilities to our vendors. Uh, for example, Mabel House, Barnes Amphitheater. We have not told these private entities to cancel their events. We are encouraging them to honor the, and watch what the CDC is recommending. Uh, but at this point, we're not offering any more future or current rentals. Uh, we're gonna let these pass out. We're gonna encourage uh, them not to carry out, but we're falling short of saying we're canceling your event when they have a contract with us um, to do an event. The libraries and our, our Cobb Extension office, several events canceled. Libraries have been aggressively communicating with our stakeholders and patrons. As you know, the spring book sale, which I'm sad about, was canceled. Uh, but obviously, we understand why. And our plant sale was not canceled. 
uh, but it will be over this Saturday and we move from there. We won't be having any more events like that. Next slide. <clears throat> I've already talked about what elections is doing. I'm going to read from the slide. I think you can see most of that stuff there. I do want to emphasize poll worker attrition was an issue, but I don't think that's an issue anymore with the decisions coming down from the Secretary of State and from the state office uh, and the delaying of the primary. Our senior centers, uh, again, Dr. Gibson's done a great job. Uh, I will mention bullet number three. We, we thought, uh, I'm sorry, number two. We thought we can tell the seniors, hey, try to slow down, but uh, <laughs> they, they feel they own those centers. And <laughs> so we had to make that call. Uh, they were coming still coughing and sneezing and working out. Um, our essential activities, however, for seniors will be continued, and that is uh, anything that's a medical necessity where seniors depend on our system, we're going to continue on anything that requires food, meal delivery. And we have taken in some of the, the ideas that you talked about, Commissioner Ott. I've discussed that with Dr. Gibson, and they have incorporated. They were already two steps ahead of us. They were already considering that. I think I have one more slide, and this is what I um, want to maybe spend slight time on indicating we know that this won't go away in two or three weeks. And so our stature, our posture now is sustainability. What happens if and when we reopen? How are we going to operate? And so staff will be looking at these things. Uh, and Commissioner Cupid, you mentioned screening. I think airports are doing screening. We are going to look at ideas uh, uh, for seniors to perhaps what can we do to see if a senior comes in not feeling well and they're just determined to go in and work out, but they're sneezing, coughing with a temperature, we may try to look at what options we have. That's something we'll be looking at. Um, returning to normal operations with school systems, county managers are going to make that call when our recreation facilities and our libraries open up. But uh, we will be working on educating and informing staff on appropriate practice. And of course, we all are ramping up our sanitation and cleaning efforts. And I think that's my last slide. I'll take any questions if you have any. Yes, um, a question regarding anyone who may have a contract for any of our facilities. You stated that we are not canceling our contracts. If another entity were to cancel, are they going to face any fees? Or no, we, we are actually honoring um, if they cancel, we are refunding. Okay, thank you. Or they can reschedule it. Yes, if, or they can have a credit. Keep their deposit or whatever. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I was going to ask about why these centers are closed. Are we going to disinfect and sanitize them all? Yes, ma'am. I was um, talking with uh, Director Poyer, and they have on their annual contract two, twice a year for a deep cleaning. Mm -hmm. This would be a good opportunity to execute one of those deep cleanings. Mm -hmm. And then also we're going to educate ourselves on some sanitation practices and things that we can do uh, in the event the reopen occurs in the future. Thank you. And just emphasizing it, meals and meals on wheels will continue. Yes, ma'am. Meals on wheels. Uh, we are taking appropriate precautions recommended by the health department when we enter into a home uh, to deliver those meals. But yes, meals on wheels and any medical necessities. We got some. Some of our clients require a dialysis transport, and what, obviously what that the, has to happen. One of the other things that um, Willie and I talked about was, you know, seniors that potentially live alone, do not have any family in the area, um, if they have to self-quarantine, how do they get food? So they may not be officially in the Meals on Wheels program. And that that's what we had talked about yesterday. And, and I guess, um, Dr. Gibson, you're way ahead of me. So good. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Ross. Afternoon, commissioners. Ross Cavett in Communications. Um, downstairs, we're working internally. We've got the uh, call center in our office that handles 53,000 calls a year, and it seems like they've gotten 53,000 in the last week. But we are um, working to try to have that uh, transferred remotely if we have to do some sort of uh, uh, work remotely programming communications. Working with IS on that right now, and I'm told we'll be testing that tomorrow. If not, we'll have some uh, essential personnel come in and continue to staff that. I think it's important to keep the main line open. Um, during this situation. Uh, also, there's 23 of those switchboards around the county. We're going to work with uh, those switchboards to provide consistent messaging and any instructions if they uh, need that, if they can't staff those call centers. And uh, we've also 
um, been using our um, HR um, swift reach text messaging. I can instantly fire off a text message to uh, 60 county leaders. Uh, they'll be getting one this afternoon, in fact, and that'll be in place as we go through this. If people get scattered, we at least have one quick way to contact everyone with essential information. Externally, um, we already are able to work remotely. If it comes down to that, we can pretty much do what we need to do inside. We can do it outside. Uh, a big portion of my staff has VPN capabilities, so we can get in and work on the website no matter where we are. Been holding daily conference calls with public health partners and cities and others. Uh, I've talked to some people in the last week more than I've talked to them in the last year, um, and that will continue going forward. We have a pretty good line of communications going on, so we stay in our lane and make sure that if people have questions, we send them to the uh, right uh, authority rather than trying to answer it ourselves or give out incorrect information. And of course, we have our Cobb TV resources that we can access remotely as well, and we'll have some folks here, obviously, this week to keep everybody updated. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Good afternoon. You knew there had to be one downer up here. Um, we're not optimally placed to handle such an emergency. Um, so we have uh, used our mutual aid uh, compact with the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office and are working out the details for having them provide us with an isolation suite. Ours is currently under construction. It's coming along nicely. It'll be ready in six months. Not good enough now. Um, we've also requested additional cooler capacity through the Georgia Department of Public Health. Um, hopefully we'll find out today. We have created a draft protocol for triaging and managing our decedents. Um, we're going to work with the public health or uh, the health department as well to make sure that our planning is meeting their needs and their guidelines. Um, but uh, we're going to have to get creative. And I don't even know what that's going to look like yet. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gulledge. Good afternoon, Commissioners, County Manager, um, Sharon Stanley, Support Services Agency Head. So you've heard a lot of the departments talk about some of their cleaning, so I want to just talk in general because we're managing some of those contracts. So early on, um, because CDC has said that cleanliness and hygiene is so important in controlling this, early on we began cleaning our buildings and ramping up and sanitizing in our buildings. In addition to the daily cleaning, we started wiping down common services, surfaces um, where, where we had citizens coming in or employees. In addition to that, um, we also checked very early on with Cobb Douglas Health to make sure that our cleaning supplies before any of this actually got out of hand were acceptable and that the processes we were using and they gave us some guidelines for our cleaning employees um, for them to use so we've implemented some of those as far as that goes as well and check that all of our um, cleaning supplies are um, EPA approved as antimicrobial against the um, COVID-19 virus. Additionally um, we have ordered and they should be in this week I'm thinking Scott will, can tell me exactly when I think it's tomorrow additional hand sanitizer stations to put throughout the county with that as well. Um, we also have several of the foggers, which are my, which fog with micro um, antimicrobial fog that is not caustic and not dangerous for the people that are doing it. They don't have to wear masks, et cetera. Um, so we have been spraying down common areas um, frequented by the public in the county for the last week and we'll continue to do that as, as additional supplies come in this week with that. And those are just general guidelines we use in any building that we're doing in the county right now and cleaning, including our um, contractors who are cleaning. But we do have additional um, procedures we put in place for areas that have been exposed um, to um, individuals with either um, who have been in first contact with COVID um, or, or coronavirus patients or in high risk populations like the senior centers. Um, we put some of that in place. We have been cleaning the senior centers daily and then deep cleaning them and misting them on weekends. This weekend we um, went into all the senior centers and actually cleaned them and misted them down with antimicrobial um, fog or mist, whatever, whatever you call that. And then we also, um, if we have facilities that are suspected exposure, they'll be deep cleaned like the West Cobb Library. That was deep cleaned this weekend by our vendor. Um, if if um, we have those and, and as um, 
um, Mr. Tank's indicated, Director Tank's indicated, will be they'll, that same contractor will be deep cleaning some of these other libraries during their closure period. We also, in facilities, we haven't unfortunately had to do this yet, but facilities with confirmed cases in the building, um, they'll be cleaned by a third party that, that because there's no in between. It's either clean like normal deep clean or you have to actually EPA recommends a, a different type of cleaning for where you have a confirmed case in there and we'll be bringing in a vendor to do that um, using EPA guidelines for COVID exposure with that. The other thing is that Scott, um, our property management director has been meeting with all of our vendors because we have several we have contracts with for cleaning to get their um, plans for what they plan to do with this to make sure they continue to clean and to make sure that all of them um, to check to see if they are cleaning for COVID or are going to be certified to clean if this happens to get worse. We've been checking for that as well as meeting with additional distributors um, for to see if we need to expand our list of cleaners if we have to do that in that case um, with that and to check with pricing, of course. Any questions? Thank you. Yes, sir. Have we had any confirmed cases in any of our buildings? Not any confirmed cases, no, ma'am. Okay. We've had contacts, but no, no confirmed cases at all. You say contacts external to our building? The, 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 the contact of a contact of a contact. Okay. You, you know, you get a lot of reports when they when that everybody's nervous. <laughs> okay. So. Some of this may need to be discussed uh, privately, but we are tracking a possible. Okay. So the, the case that I know of is um, a, a patron of one of our voucher program that needed assistance was in the facility um, four days before, prior to symptoms being present and then another three or four days prior to her um, test coming back positive. But she did have this patron did come into a facility um, with direct contact with an employee. Okay. And then... That facility has been... Okay, and I would ask, you would just follow your protocol. They did not require to check. CDC does not require to deep clean with, like it has a virus, because she's prior to... Okay. Presenting the symptoms. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Jessica Gwynn, Cobb County Community Development. As you all know, many of the services that our agency provides um, really support the businesses in our community, um, particularly the construction industry. So our goal here is to be sure that we are um, ensuring the safety and the health of our employees as well as our customers at community development, but still continuing to maintain a level of service so that we don't have a negative impact on the local economy. As such, some of the steps that we've taken, um, first of all, our one-stop and site plan review meetings have been canceled until further notice. We are still accepting plans. We're still reviewing plans, just rather than coming in, sitting down face-to-face -to, -face to go over those comments. We're providing all those electronically. Inspections will continue as per usual. Um, just to give you some idea, on a slow day, we have about 300 inspections. On a busy day, it's about 600. We do expect that we may see some tapering off of that given the current circumstances. So we're gonna to continue to, to watch our numbers there and see um, how those inspections trend and whether or not there's any need for staffing adjustment. Code enforcement, again, just like with inspections, both of those groups, they're, they're gonna to continue to have some face-to-face -face interaction, but we're trying to limit that as much as possible. Um, particularly right now with code enforcement, inspections we recognize that there are a lot more people who are at home right now than typically a lot of times code enforcement goes out they'll go visit a property nobody's home to actually deliver the the violation notice to or to speak with um, we do expect that we will have more people at home and our plan is to still mail those violations rather than having that face-to-face -face interaction and exchange of the violation notice okay. violations typically have to be cured within 14 to 14 days so how does that follow-up occur and um, even with code enforcement cases there's limited um, operation within our court system so is there going to be any suspension of 
of those activities? It will be more limited than it has been as far as as far as reinspections or or maybe a delayed reinspection, uh, particularly given the changes with the court system. Typically, we do our compliance checks whenever we're a little bit closer to the court date. Um, so we recognize that there may be some some adjustment there that's needed. Okay. Okay. I presume a, a citizen can contact your office if they have any concerns. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We will still be taking those calls and, of course, emails um, regarding code enforcement complaints. Okay. Is there any time to discuss that? Um, a few other Before things that we're doing, of course, we've had the complete count committee, and with the, the census coming up, census day, of course, April 1st, um, that committee has been active. We don't have any meetings currently scheduled, and our plan is that if we need to reconvene that committee for any reason over the course of the next few weeks, we'll certainly do that by conference call rather than a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, we do have a license review board meeting that was scheduled on March 19th, so this Thursday, but since this morning we have gone ahead and canceled that license review board meeting, and those cases will be moved into April. Uh, so we are, we are notifying. We only had two cases there. Um, and expect that to have minimal impact. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Uh, typically with our zoning applications, if someone comes in for a zoning request, they'll of course bring their application in and we have a meeting where they come in and they meet with staff to talk about, um, to get some feedback on it. Again, we're going to cancel those zoning applicant meetings for the time being. We will still review those and we'll be sending that communication through email. So they're still getting feedback from staff, but again, doing it in such a way that limits that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, one thing that I know is on your radar is we do have a VOC zoning hearing scheduled tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And just to give you some idea of kind of where we are with that, we've had a lot of discussion about it. Uh, we only have about 10 cases to be heard. We don't expect that we're going to have a large crowd. We have been talking with, with Tony to make sure that the learning center is available. So if we do have a crowd here or if we do have people here who don't feel comfortable um, being in the room and we need to have some not really overflow space, but some additional space to, you know, provide social distancing. Mr. Chairman, no, I, I can't support that. that. Yeah, I Me think I'm, um, I'm hearing from a lot of the board members that we have to set the example. So if we have something like this tomorrow, it sets the wrong message. So I think there's a lot of support on the board that we're going to go ahead and postpone the meeting tomorrow. Do you want a motion, the, Mr. Chairman? Uh, well, I have to. Um, I don't think that requires a motion, does it? Yeah, the chairman has the authority pursuant, okay, pursuant I just to the resolution if he wants to postpone or delay yeah. uh, the yeah. zoning meeting itself. So. Well, my, my concern is you, you have about 10 cases to be heard, but you also have about 9 or 10 on consent. Right. But sometimes people show up to oppose those, um, so you really have 19 cases total um, on the calendar. Yeah, because anyone who comes to consent... The, I'm sorry, I apologize. The, um, my concern is these are public hearings. Each side gets 10 minutes to speak, and we can't tell people to stay home and or if somebody is sick or, you know, not come into a crowd of 50 people or more. Um, we're denying them their due process to speak if they're not comfortable coming to a crowd or a public hearing. So... I think we need to move all the cases to April. Yeah, my, my, my experience has been is that at the start of the meeting, you have lots of people here, because even though it's here for consent, generally looks favorably. If you're here for consent, you're going to be you know, supported. If you're not here, then, you know, so right. we're going to have a lot of people here tomorrow morning initially. Right. And that goes, you know, that'll probably, probably fly in the face of the CDC 50-person deadline. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, unless there's some ser serious opposition by the board. Uh, go ahead and postpone the March meeting until further notice. Now, I'm in support and um, have shared that with staff from last week. I have two cases which could have a number of people present in opposition, and they were generally concerned because their activities have been limited um, with um, calls for um, people to socially distance themselves. However, their participation in their in the, their cases of interest could impact the outcome of those cases. Sure. So I support the um, intent of the board from what it appears to cancel. And, and Mr. Chairman, we, you know, we talk a lot about the, um, the citizens that want to come. Um, I've actually talked to some applicants that they do not want to have to come. Okay. All right. So, so we're going to go ahead and postpone it. Okay. okay. That sounds good. A good try. 
Uh, we are glad to take whatever the direction the board wants yeah, to, but we certainly want you to know that. we're thinking about it either way and trying to plan. Well, we're going to we're going to look. We all know that we're going to give this a couple of weeks to see what happens, and then a couple of weeks we'll look at everything again. Right. Uh, I think it's best way to see how what impact the current mitigation measures are going to take have before we start making major decisions about rescheduling meetings. Well, everything moved to April. Well, that's for on now. Slide. For now. Okay. Um, Jessica, I have just one other question. What What does this do to the um, application deadline tomorrow for May zoning? Or we are still tomorrow is a accepting deadline. applications. We are. Um, okay. Yes, we are still accepting applications and had not planned to stop accepting applications. I was going to recommend today um, that we do look at moving the April Planning Commission and Board of Zoning Appeals cases to May. The Planning Commission workshop is coming up on March 30th, so it's, it's upon us. Um, and if we go ahead and make that move now, then we can go ahead and, yeah, and get those signs changed and everything. That, that's the, reasonable, the absolutely. Sure. Then we'll, we'll do the same, of course, with the March cases, right. too, if we're going okay. to postpone that meeting. Um, we'll just plan to push those out till May. Um, the April Historic Preservation Commission meeting, um, the deadline for that is March 27th. We don't have any applications for that at this point, so our recommendation is to go ahead and cancel the April meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission. I don't know that we'll get any applications, but we'll go ahead and make that move. Um, two things that I wanted to put on your radar, and both of these are, are items that are specified by the code, so I think it's important that we, we get some board input on this. Um, and we are currently in the renewal season for business licenses, and we've had a great renewal season. The renewals are coming in, and we're very happy with how that's going. Um, however, by code, 90 days after the payments are due for the occupation tax, at that point, there's a 10% penalty that we start to collect. So that starts on April 1st. Um, one thing that I was going to suggest is that we should defer collection of that 10% penalty to May at the earliest, perhaps even June 1st, given the current circumstances. On a similar note, um, for alcohol excise payments, the code specifies that those payments are be, to be made by the 20th of the month. Um, I was going to suggest that we may want to look at some leniency there to give a little additional time given the circumstances um, for getting those payments in. Uh, one other thing that's also specified by code is, you know, again, we're in our renewal season. The only way per code that we can accept payment for alcohol licenses is by certified funds. Um, we were going to... Everything else we can accept credit card payments for by phone. You know, business licenses you can pay for by phone um, without actually coming into the office. Um, in the interest of reducing foot traffic in our office, as well as the, you know, accepting checks and money and all that sort of thing, um, we were going to ask that we authorize credit card payments for alcohol regulatory fees. I think it should be done for a period of time, not forever moving forward. But like what period of time are we talking about? I don't know, maybe three months, four maybe months. Until, yeah, just maybe until the um, public health emergency is, is canceled. You know I mean, because I, I, I think there's a reason why we don't have credit cards. And right. so, I mean, you know, I understand why we want, might want to do it now. But um, and it may be that they come back to us and change the policy permanently. But right. I think on a temporary basis, just do it until the public health emergency is, is canceled. Yeah. And to your point, Commissioner, I, um, I asked Alicia this morning, our business license manager, and of course Alicia has a lot more um, institutional knowledge about this than I do. She's been with the county a very long time. Um, we're not quite sure why the code calls for that. It's not something tied to state legislation, but our plan is to right, look at and that's the alcohol what I kind of code, and we expect that you know down the road as we look at the alcohol alcohol code and bring forth some recommendations, that might be something we recommend to change. But certainly for now, just right, and that's health. that's what I kind of figured because right. it's probably one of those things that's been there for a while. But yeah. since it is in the code and require a code change, you might want to just. Well, I don't. I don't think that the deferment of the ten percent. You know the ten percent penalty on the business license renewals requires any kind of. I think that's a that's a administrative action that the department can take. Or you want a motion? Well, you'd have to have an agenda item for, or, or you could take her as at her recommendation as part of an agenda item, and then if the board wanted to vote on that and give her the leniency or the or the county commissioner no, we, the ability to be able to do that, that'd be fine. We can do that now, right? Add it, make a motion to add an agenda item, and then vote on the agenda item, right? Pam? 
Yes. Yeah. But that's this. Yeah. I, I saw the nature of this meeting is what it is. It allows us to do those kind of actions right now, right? Correct. Okay. That's what she's so, asking for, that special power to so, do that. Yes. Um, I'll make a motion. We defer to 10% penalty for business life renewals until? June 1st. June 1st. Yes, sir. Second. Discussion. Call a question. <laughs> Pass the five to zero. Do you want to? All right. I'll Absolutely. make a motion that um, the board authorizes uh, community development to you accept credit card payments for the alcohol regulatory fees until the governor declares the public health emergency over. Okay, so let's add the agenda item, right? We're gonna add that to the agenda, then we're gonna vote on the agenda item, right? That's how we're gonna right. work, right, Bill? Okay, so that's the agenda, we're gonna add to the agenda item. That's yes. what's your motion. Second. We have a second, discussion? Okay, call a question. <clears throat> okay, pass slide to zero. Now, I'm gonna call a question about uh, deferring the 10% penalty for business license renewals. Any discussion on that? Call a question. Passes five to zero, and then I'm going to call the question on authorizing credit card payments for alcohol regulatory fees. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Sorry. Hey, Commissioner Burrow. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, sir, the the additional item was the alcohol excise taxes, which are due the twentieth of the month. If if we could. Um, have authorization to waive penalties for the March and April payments, perhaps. Um, again, that's specified by code. Okay, well, he, he, Commissioner Rao wanted to do it until the end of the public health emergency, right? That's for the credit cards. Yeah, the credit cards. Okay. So I'll, I'll make a motion to add to the agenda um, the authorization for community development to defer the, what did you call it? Collection. The penalties for the alcohol the penal excise tax. Right, the penalties for the alcohol excise tax until the end of the public health emergency. We have a second? Second. Discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. Now, I want to call a question as presented. Any discussion? Call the question. Passes five to zero. All right. And that's all I have. Thank you all. Um, and I know that's, that's going to be a big help for us as we, again, continue to do our best to serve our, our businesses during this time. So okay, well, thank, thank you. Appreciate thank you for that. it. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners, and County Manager, Judy Jones, Cobb Water. I'd like to start by ensuring everybody that our drinking water is safe. According to the CDC, coronavirus is not transmitted through chlorinated drinking water, so we do have safe water. Um, we purchase our drinking water from the Cobb Marietta Water Authority and distribute it to our customers. So my first slide is going to cover the things that the Water Authority is doing. So um, on an ongoing basis, even prior to coronavirus, they, um, the chlorine residuals are modeled, monitored at its two treatment plants 24 hours a day, 365 days a year to ensure optimal removal of contaminants including viruses and bacteria. In addition, they take more than 200 samples in our distribution system each month to ensure that the chlorine levels are maintained and disinfection is, is taken care of in our system. Um, so a couple of things that they're doing to ensure con continuity of operations. They have an emergency action plan that's tailored to pandemics. They are currently in the precautionary stage, which includes employee education, staff monitoring, and CDC preventative uh, guidance actions. Uh, they have um, identified minimum staffing requirements for drinking water treatment plants, and um, if they need to implement going down to just minimum staffing, they will do that. They have also identified um, employees within, um, within their organization that, ha that have certified operator licenses that don't currently work in the plants that could be brought into their plants if they need to, if they have staffing issues. And then finally, um, they have canceled all in-person meetings with non-water authority uh, staff unless absolutely required for their operations. So the next slide, uh, these are things that we, the water system, are doing. So uh, first, we want to ensure dependable water service. And to do that, uh, non-essential water line shutdowns that impact residential customers, numerous residential customers, will be, delay be delayed for at least two weeks. So we're going to work with our contractors and our developers who are out there doing projects to delay any, any shutdowns that we can for at least two weeks, and then we'll monitor after that. 
Um, water line shutdowns that impact commercial customers will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And finally, uh, customers who are having difficulty paying their water bills, we will assist them to the extent possible, including um, giving them payment arrangements as needed. And then for our continuity of operations, we also have identified minimum staffing requirements for our wastewater treatment plants, um, and then we can implement those if we need to. Um, although we aren't anticipating any uh, trouble getting chemicals, we are topping off our chemical tanks at all of our treatment plants to ensure that we have the chemicals that we need to provide the treatment at, the, at our wastewater treatment plants. Uh, our water line and sewer line maintenance crews currently all meet at one location. So starting this week, we're gonna decentralize them. We're gonna have them split and report to one of six different locations so they're not all get congregating at the same area every morning. Uh, our field staff, um, when they need to contact a property owner because they're working um, in front of their yard, we've uh, told them to maintain at least six feet of separation and then we're gonna to go to trying to contact that customer by phone or email if we can, rather than knocking on the door. Um, and then finally, um, we are, this week we're gonna suspend taking in-person payments at our customer service building. We are encouraging customers to pay through our drive-through, it will remain open, our lockbox, online, uh, by calling us, by using our automated phone system, or by mailing a check. Um, in addition, if customers need to start service or cancel service, they can do that online, and they can also do that by calling us rather than coming in the office. Um, Judy, one thing, and I know I just did it um, last week, just a reminder to folks that the if you are paying by automatic payment, you have till when, May 1st, is it, that you have to go over to the new system? Yes. Yes, you might want to make sure that um, Ross puts that out, and, it, and if we continue doing newsletters, because... Otherwise, those automatic payments will stop, correct? And before we discontinue any of those, we are going to reach out to those customers. So if, if we have people that haven't switched over by May 1st, we're going to contact them directly rather than just, just you know, eliminating that. A uh, couple things. First of all, I would really encourage you on this uh, third bullet on the top, including scheduling of payment arrangements. There may be a lot of people impacted by this um, uh, coronavirus uh, who are hourly workers and work I would encourage you to work real real carefully with them all right I think they're good people who are going through some really tough times and whatever you can do to help them out I think they would really appreciate it and they'll be lifelong friends of yours forever because the circumstances they're going through are, are like none other other than a recession 10 years ago and the second one if you are going to have more calling service calling customer service are you going to put in additional lines and, and uh, people to take those phone calls I mean, if you're encouraging this, that means you're going to get more phone calls, and what we don't want to have is a lot of busy signals. So right. my question is, what are we doing to to, uh, to prepare for that contingency? So uh, currently it takes about six weeks to train somebody to take those phone calls because oh. of all of our policies, so we can't really add any any staff to do that. We're going to work with the staff that we have okay. to answer those questions. Uh, you might want to think about it if you can, you know, tell you to do your job, but bringing people back that are retired something like that. Look at all options to do that because it's one thing to advertise that and it's something else saying, please be patient. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, something we might be able to do is, and I don't know how many folks are on this part of the uh, agency, but um, maybe staggering shifts so that you can extend the hours that they would be able to call in. Um, I don't, do we have 24 hour calling? No, we do not. Right. So Look. maybe what you could do is if it's say only eight hours in the day, and you know, people are working specific times, maybe stagger when the employees come in so that we can cover a, a wider range of times. So one thing we wanna be careful to do is with the social distancing, we are actually, we want to minimize the number of people that have to come into our office and work in that area, but we, we can answer questions online and help customers. We have an email address so that we're gonna really try to push customers to email us. If the phones are busy, you know, send an email and we'll answer them via email. And we can put some more people on helping out with the emails. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Mr. Chairman, can I say something before Jackie comes up and does the BOC thing? I just want to um, thank all the employees. Um, clearly, a whole lot of work went into all of this. Um, the thing that's impressed me the most, we have a whole lot of new agency heads that have had to kind of step up 
and really kind of not just hit the ground running, but hit the ground in a sprint. And so I just want to say thank you. I'm sure the board echoes that sentiment, absolutely. Yes. Thank you. We appreciate that because we do know that a lot of people had to give up their weekend to do this, and they were happy to do it because this is something that we need to do to ensure our employees that we care about them and that we want to make it right, as well as our, um, our citizens that we serve to let them know we are trying to address some of the issues and concerns that they have. Is there, a, is there a weekend, really? I know, right? <laughs> I feel you. So a great segue is that if we do need to bring someone back, I think Steve McCullers is retired. <laughs> if we want to bring someone back to answer the phone. Uh, but no, seriously, on the Board of Commissioners General Guidelines, we are looking at, first of all, we're not doing an overall county closure or shutdown. However, we do recommend that there are uh, some limited operational services via a skeletal crew of folk as determined by the department heads and approval by the county manager's office effective this Wednesday, March 18th at 12.01 a.m. until further notice by the county manager's office. So what we are asking is that some employees who are non-essential in order to make sure that we are listening to the guidance from public health and are not putting folk uh, at danger or in danger or clustering or whatever, we are asking some employees to work from home, to telework. And with that, we have asked the department heads to look at the not only the number of folk, but the essential positions that need to actually report to the office. So again, the county is not asking the board to close down, but we are going to be asking you to allow us through the county manager's office to direct some offices to work from home and others will actually come into the office. So we're encouraging the elected officials, constitutional officers as well, to do what they feel is appropriate for their operation. Next, those departments that we are asking to work in a limited capacity or to be able to provide services, just as Judy talked about, through technology and different ways of getting their services met, like community development, water, tax assessor's office, the tax commissioner's office, DOT, and others, we're asking them to think creatively and out of the box so that they can minimize person-to-person -person contact as has been directed by our public health officials. So we are going to be closing some uh, facilities, and you all have been uh, prized of those, like senior services, our libraries, some of our recreational centers, and some of the other facilities. We will be closing some of our lobbies, public intake areas, and in some cases, entire buildings in instances where technology, drive through call-in service, or queued space service can be provided. We are going to implement those protocols in concert with CDC guidelines, including social distance guidelines. So with that, I thank all of the departments for giving you a, a quick and detailed update on how they have been addressing some of these issues. But at this time, I would just like to, to ask Tony to bring forward those policies, employee-related policies, that we are now going to ask you to take action upon, unless there are questions about any other yes. departments that have been uh, before you this afternoon. Yes. Commissioner Cupid. Yes. and. Um, we may be on the same wavelength here. With the um, limited operational services, it's my understanding that we will be encouraging employees who are non-essential um, to um, the function of their department, mm -hmm. that they can work from home or? Yes. yes. OK. So um, those that will be encouraged to come in will be those who are in a transactional department, which you have listed, mm -hmm. but on a limited basis. Yes. With the skeletal crew, as determined by the department head, which it states. So an employee who is a non-transactional employee whose um, role is not, is, is not necessary to that department operation, 
on site, they mm-hmm. will be encouraged to work home. Yes. Okay. And that's general across every department. Yes. Okay. And we're asking um, the departments again to think creatively about how they choose to do that. So, for example, some departments are staggering. Folk who may come in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, another group may come in Tuesday, Thursday. They may look at it where there's a group that comes in 8 to noon or 8 to 1. Okay. And another group may come in. So because this is happening so quickly, Mm -hmm. they haven't had a chance to really, the department heads haven't had a chance to really put all of this into place. So we're asking you, the board, to trust us and the county manager's office to work with them to be able to do what we need to do to make sure that county government continues to operate, but in a manner that takes into account their overall well-being as well, in addition to the point that you brought up about child care. So we have to be cognizant of that as well. So with that, we're saying we don't have all of the answers today, but we will have them by the end of the day Okay. And tomorrow, so that this would, if you so approve, which is what we are saying we're doing, would take effect Wednesday morning. Great. Um, another question sure. related. And I'm in support of that. Um, for employees who work part-time, um, how will their pay be impacted by their limited presence so let's go through the policies that Tony's going to talk about, and he will address that. Okay. Okay? Because it, it does have some implications for part-time employees okay. as well as full-time. Very good. Tony? Good afternoon. So the, the task force and the HR and legal have worked to bring three policies to the board today that we feel like we need your action during this uh, event, pandemic event. So I'll start with the first one. I guess to answer your question, uh, Commissioner Kubi, we'll start with the inclement weather policy. So uh, we've taken the existing inclement weather and and, uh, made some changes to it to accommodate the current pandemic event and are recommending a change in the title so it can be used ongoing for this event and for the future with inclement weather um, to call it an emergency closure policy with the revisions that have been presented. And within that policy, it did have language in there about how making up, allowing part-time employees to make up time for inclement weather events. But in this event, because it could be a longer closing period, we've recommended removal of that language going forward. So that, so that way, the entire policy would apply to the whole workforce, whether you're part-time or full-time. So okay. if there's a closure impacting the time you're normally scheduled to work with your part-time, then you would be paid for the time you would be normally scheduled to work. Okay, thank you. Do you want me to go through each policy, or do you want to take action with each one? No, we. Um, I think we we've had the policies for a couple of days, so we should be able to just go through each one. Okay, so the second one is a public health emergency response policy. Um, this was a new policy that was created specifically for this event um, to cover the COVID nineteen. So the employees who were actually impacted directly, whether they've been an exposure or there's a quarantine that's required them to be out of the workplace, so they would be on paid administrative leave and not be required to use any of their accrued sick sick or annual. Any questions on that? Okay. The next one is the telework. Hold on. Commissioner Gamble has a question. I have questions on the first one. Sure. Go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. I wasn't sure because I also have questions on the emergency closure policy. Um, but on this one, the public health emergency policy, number C specifically. Okay. So that way you can, is where I'm at. Okay. It, it says any employee that has been sent home by the county, and then essentially, how are we know they're going to be able to be tested? Because we're hearing that not everyone is being allowed to be tested if they don't meet all the criteria. So if we require them to be tested in order to have them be gone, how are we going to handle that? Well, we, we will require them to provide documentation to get the paid admin leave. In practice now, what happens whenever administrative leave is used for other purposes, if it, it becomes timing with payroll to get an employee paid, we may use uh, some of their accrued leave, but then when we get the documentation that we needed from the health department or from a practitioner, then we would reverse that and restore their leave and put paid admin leave in, in the Okay, system. so if they're not diagnosed with the COVID-19, then are you going to go back to which policy? Because you sent them home based on this policy, but if they don't test, 
if they've been sent home by management, it would be an admin leave paid, whether it's through a medical event or through the county manager authorizing that. And, and Commissioner Gamble, I think um, that if you kind of think about the sequence that we've been told that happens is like in your workplace, if your boss or where you think that you might have the symptoms, you go home, um, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna go through, and I think the president outlined it in the news conference on Friday, that online there's gonna be this kind of decision tree you're gonna go through and it's gonna ask you this question and that question and then ultimately if you're a candidate for testing, it's going to send you to go get tested. And then when you go get tested, then it's right, Janet. Am I? How am I doing here? Theoretically, right, theory. right. That that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> but I mean, I, I think what Tony's saying is, you know, if we send you home, clearly it's an administrative decision. And then um, if the disease progresses and you do indeed have it, then you're going to get tested. And if you don't, well, then you're covered by the fact that we sent you home. Okay. And then also, um, how are we going to handle if a, an employee is admitted and we don't know to the hospital? How will that be communicated back to us because of the HIPAA? I mean, will that be communicated back to the county so that we can take corrective action? Or how will we know if the employee isn't sent home by us, but they are admitted? If, the, if they've been admitted to the hospital, it would be like any other sick event. We would ask for some kind of medical certification for them to be turned back to work. And that would have information. But I guess in this instance, if, if they're admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 and, and we've got a potential direct exposure, how would, how would that be communicated back to us so that we could then notify the appropriate department or people that could be potentially affected? I think right now the, the task force through, working through Dr. Morris has asked that uh, EMA be notified when the department management is aware as well as human resources so that there are people at the county that can work with the health department to make sure that tracking is occurring. But we do have to be very careful mm -hmm. with HIPAA in doing that so the appropriate people will be notified. Well, I don't think an employee would give us permission for to know that. They trust me, they're letting us know if they think that they have been exposed yeah. or have had uh, an indirect contact or a direct contact. They are letting us know right now. And then we're telling them to follow the appropriate step as steps as outlined by public health officials. Well, I don't, I don't know of a single instance when an employee had some kind of a medical issue that even if they didn't tell us about it, somebody in their family or friends told us about it. In other words, we didn't have somebody going to the hospital or die in this county and we didn't know about it exactly. forthwith. So whatever that informal process is, it seems to be working. Yeah. And I think the same thing would happen here because if you, it, particularly if you know that that's your primary breadwinner, you're going to want to make sure that your employee knows that they've been admitted to the hospital so that, you know, the, you know, the benefits continue. Well, I think also, too, if, if it's somebody that we sent home, then their, their manager or their boss is going to kind of be checking up on them to see if they're coming back because we just talked about how we're going to be rotating people in and out. Um, and, you know, if, if they hadn't been sent home and all of a sudden end up in the hospital, well, their boss is going to be wondering where they are. So, I mean, I don't think it's going to go, like the chairman says, unnoticed that, that they're not here. If it comes back positive, we, if we talk to the patient, we've already you know, as a contact. Thanks. Okay. You have a question, I'm sure. No, no, no. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Did you have one on the teleworking one? Or is the third one? Yeah, you have? but you're going to let Tony. Well, you said you had a question. Well, he just did teleworking, so. No, no, he just did public health emergency. He hasn't done teleworking. Oh. I thought we just did teleworking, didn't we? No, sir. We, I, I didn't. I was about to present that one. Oh, go ahead. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, she was the, right. I was wrong. I'll listen to my tie. <laughs> Again. Uh, the teleworking policy is one that's been in place for, for a long time. We just had been planning to bring it anyway to the board this year. This just escalated uh, bringing it forward. And so we've uh, made changes out to be more relevant during our current times um, to accommodate teleworking in the department. So. Those changes are, are noted as in, in the copies that you've received. Now, Commissioner Gamble. Okay, and um, second page, it says, teleworking is not an alternative to child or elder care. Yet in the public safety presentation, they said they were going to be allowing people to tele telework in order to provide child care. So we're now in conflict with what we're doing with our actual policy that's being presented. 
I didn't. I don't think that's what. Randy, yep. I don't think that's what he said no, uh, or meant. Randy, you want to come and say uh, that bullet that talked about monitoring? What, what did you really mean to say, Randy? Yeah, I don't <laughs> think it said that we were. The, the intent of someone being able to telework from home would be those people who are essential employees that also may have child care issues. And by essential means, we need them to work. It's on page seven of our presentation packet. They'll be working just from home. That's right. Right, but our telecommunication policy clearly states that it's you're not supposed to be working from home for the purpose of child care or elderly care. Yeah, but I, I, I think that, all right, so let me, let me just kind of separate it out here. We, we kind of have two different situations we're talking about here. One is just a normal teleworking policy, which would be on a normal, normal day, not in the middle of a pandemic, where we do not allow someone to telework from home because they have to deal with child care. But I think what Randy was saying, hopefully not putting words in your mouth, was that under the consideration of what we're doing right now, because we are going to be sending employees home, and and if they can do their work from home, we would much rather have them at home, regardless of whether it's for child care or whatever, we would much rather have them at home than here, you know, with being able to do the social distancing. And so I think that you, you kind of have to look at it from two different, two different ways. The teleworking policy, which we were told, you know, they were going to be bringing this back to us anyway, okay? But what the PowerPoint is kind of really during, dealing with the COVID-19 policy. And so, yes, they might be a little bit in conflict with each other, but the pandemic thing is kind of a special circumstance, whereas some of these changes I think they're proposing in the teleworking is kind of more long-term. In, in um, recognition of um, Commissioner Garambrill's observation, <clears throat> page 10, of 13 of this packet. Page 10? Page 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of the teleworking policy. The first sentence. Yeah. What, page, what page? Page number? 10. Page 10 at the top. This is page 10 of 13. It's the very top. Where it says any employee designated? No, teleworking is not an alternative to child or elder care, and when applicable, the teleworking it must says, make a corporate It says in bold and underlined yeah. um, what Commissioner Gambro is asserting. Mm -hmm. However, I also agree with what Commissioner Ott is saying because this is a public um, health response. So if, even if you just put a caveat in that policy that says un unless... I don't know, A, B, or C um, conditions are met. So unless there is a public health, unless there, a, there is an emergency closure, it sure. would address both concerns and still. How about, um, record. How about we put in there, unless circumstances um, are approved or something by the county manager? What, what was your wording, Commissioner Cupid, about the emergency? It was Commissioner Gamble. Okay, what was your wording? Just add, um, unless, you know, Emergency closure policy is enacted. Okay. Well, I mean, but do you want to restrict it to just that? I think that um, since it's a personnel issue, would you not want to let the county manager make the whole ending decision? Well, I think that, but the two are connected. I see what they're saying, okay? No, I mean, I see what they're saying too, but I mean, um, I don't know. It just seems to me that, that um, it's kind of a little bit more restrictive than I think it needs to be, just saying that it can only happen if the uh, emergency closure policy is in place. I mean, there could be some other circumstance that all of a sudden comes up, and by only having that in there, then you're not, you're tying the county manager's hands, where, I mean, you know, you could put in there at the discretion of the county manager and then say something, for example, if the emergency closure policy is in place or something. But I just think that there's, there could potentially be other circumstances where it may be desirable Okay. To allow it right. to happen. So That's all I'm saying. Situation. So if you incorporate both these suggestions, that takes care of it. Would right? take care of it, sir. All right. For example, emergency closure procedures. So that takes care of Commissioner Gamble's concerns, Commissioner Rott. Anybody else want to add to this sentence? No, but it's just we should have wording if we're going to vote on it. We will. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So we would, basically what I heard was this, unless the... So it's Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Ott start out with... the. At the discretion of the county manager, for example, implement, implementing emergency, emergency closure procedures, all right? 
teleworking is not an alternative to child or elder care. Sounds right? good. That's what we should say. You no, start no. that that sentence. We'll do. Got it. Okay. Yes, sir. I also right. have another question, sure. which I know I've addressed offline um, in another circumstance, but if we're encouraging teleworking, this does put the onus on the employee to still have the equipment and the other means to facilitate teleworking. So it's just important that that's made clear. And we have worked on that, Commissioner. We asked each department manager to provide to IS um, the positions, including the people who are considered essential, okay. who would need VPN mm -hmm. access from working at home. And we are also going to be communicating to all of our employees that you can actually access your email through webmail without actually needing VPN access. So that's what they are working on right now for yes. those who actually need to remote into their computer. Yeah. Sharon has that information and others who may be working from home and who just basically need to be responding to email to keep up with what's going on, they can do that as well. The other thing we are sharing with them, as you probably heard on um, television, is cybersecurity. Yeah. Uh, and Sharon has shared this with our department managers a lot of time hackers and people who want to do bad things to your network while we're focused on COVID-19 of figuring out how they can get into your system. Yeah. So we're also communicating about if you are working remotely, being careful and cognizant of the fact that, I mean, you're, you're the potential exposure. And just another um, tool, too, that can be costly is the use of phones, particularly if we're dealing with citizens or customers. And, you know, I've gone back and forth with about my assistants and do I allow them to follow up on matters by right. phone because not everything um, comes in via email. And I right. just told them that I will do I will subject myself to um, having to take any of those calls. But that is an ongoing concern that we have about. Um, than being able to work from home, but ha having to call someone um, without subjecting their um, their personal phones to um, public use. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And we will keep you guys apprised of. So if you can make any headway, that's just, yes, you know, on, on that, that would be helpful. And if you all think of other things that perhaps county manager's office hasn't thought of, because, again, this was kind of a, sure. a quick response to the request for the special call meeting, please I'm call and go you have access to minutes. us and we'll be happy to, to respond. Sure. Thank I'll you. Assume, amen. So at this time, I think there are motions. Or yeah. motions need no, okay. I have I have a conversation oh, going back to the emergency closure policy. Yes. Okay. Um, under number three, the policy. Um, it says the county manager will consult with elected officials regarding the suspension of normal operations. Again, I'm not criticizing what we've done, but I don't see that being done. Essentially, what I saw was the county manager interacting with the directors and the department heads to make the determination if closures will happen. So shouldn't the policy reflect that? Because, you know, we haven't been inputting into that, to my knowledge to as far as the closures. So my question is, is the policy as written, I'm not seeing it being followed, and do we need to amend it as such to what we're actually doing? Uh, based on what I, I'm hearing from um, HR Director Mr. Hagler, he said this is referring to other elected officials. Like court SO, courts. courts. Okay, so so can we define that? Because I know a lot of people are looking at it and saying, you know, why aren't we making the decision, we being the board, but it's not up to the board. Yes, so can we can we clarify that somehow? Sure. Uh, maybe, Jackie, you can just put in there um, parentheses again. Sure. Constitutional, Constitutional officers. Okay. Well, I would suggest it's broader than just constitutional. Right. We have other elected officials that are not necessarily constitutional right. officers. So. Okay. Which is why we well, then you put in there other than the Board of Commissioners. There you go. How about operational department? Elected officials other than the Board of Commissioners. Well, okay. that would be exclusive then, and then that, that means he would not consult with you at all at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> but I, to, to tag on to the county manager's 
um, comment. I mean, we set the policy. You guys make the decision. So, you, I mean, I know I've been involved in a couple conversations just because I was standing in the room, but, I mean, are you consulting with any of us as far as what to do? I, I know that's a loaded question, but, <laughs> but, but I mean, you, <laughs> but it, in my mind, you know, the county manager, the deputy, I mean, you guys are pretty much taking this and running with it with the department heads, um, independent of the, the board. That was direction that we received yeah. from, from the chairman as it relates to employee related matters and that we will keep you guys apprised, but based on our communication with, with the chairman, uh, it was, I mean, this thing is moving quickly. Do whatever you feel you need to do. I, I, Commissioner Gamble, I, I think mm -hmm. in, in the 12 years I've been up here, any time that we've closed the county, whether it was Wrinkleman or whether whatever, it never happened without the commissioners. Not We, we all knew that it was going to happen before right. it happened. Yeah, and I think the thing about what happened with this particular crisis is that things change day to day. It's amazing how what we knew last Saturday is different than what we know today. And there's just no way the county manager can efficiently run the, the, the county if we have to stop every, every day here and get, try to gather a consensus from the board. That's just not how something this big works. We have to trust the county manager who we, you know, uh, approved to get on with a day-to-day -day function of doing this. And they can always come back if it's an action that, uh, you know, has to be uh, pre-reviewed. But we have to give them the flexibility to, to react to a crisis as it emerges. And, and I agree with you, but we need to make sure the policy reflects that. Okay. And right now, the way the policy reads, it doesn't necessarily reflect that. Um, then, this is also seen in number five, Jackie. Um, same where, page, Commissioner? Um, emergency same? closure, yep, number five. It also says the county manager in consultation with the elected officials. Okay. Um, again, I haven't seen that happen in this event, and again, I know this event is different than a snow event, but again, I, our policy needs to be reflective of what we're doing. And then also at the very end, it says then, and then it's been corrected. It's T-H-I-S-E. Policy would be in effect. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be this or these. I think it's this. supposed to be this. Right, this. Yep, so we just need to correct that. Okay, thank you. And then <laughs> um, second page B, it would be 6B. And again, I know this policy is usually done for, you know, snow events as such. Um, but here, given we're being told that this could last eight to ten weeks, um, with doing the accrued leave as we are, we could potentially be giving employees eight to ten weeks of vacation time. Is that right. additional? Additional. Right. And that, I have the same issue with you. Like, I don't understand why. Well, they're still working. We're just making them work from home. I mean, right. But, and. But by calling, we can always call them back in at any time. So I don't understand why we're providing them uh, annual leave time when they're still in a leave status. That we just we're just making them work from home for now. It it. It's the law though too. It's it's that was put in place a number of years ago because we having so many of our public safety water staff that have to work because they're essential staff. So they're being paid to be work, but they get additional leave for the time that they're working. I get that part. But that's additional, all right? Like, for instance, if we have if we have a certain circumstance where they're going to be called and identified to work, that's one thing. But this, this is a collective body, all right, where we're all going to be essentially working from home unless we call you to work in your normal workspace. This is not the other circumstance where, you know, you're all being sent home and you're going to stay there because all operations have ceased. The county's still operating. We're right. just doing it in a modified f fashion. Right, but Mr. Chairman, I think you're answering your own question because oh. if okay. the county isn't it's officially moved. no, if the, if the county isn't officially <laughs> closed, which the very first slide said that we were doing a limited operational services, right. the county's not closed. This policy is not in place. Right. This policy is not being implemented as long as the county is open. And and I can only think of in 12 years one time that we might have closed the county. 
uh, yeah, but it was it was not just any snow. And so I think it's important, and, and Jackie mentioned it in the very beginning in her PowerPoint, that the county is not closing. So the closure policy is not being put in place. Okay. I mean, yes, you are correct that if the county closes, that's in here. But um, in this, even in this situation that we're in right now, we're not closing the county. All right. No, sir. But I, I do want to I, I do want to point out that there may be instances that there are going to be employees that are going to be for social distancing and, and public health based on public health recommendations. They're going to be employees that are going to ask to be asked to go home and they may not be working at home. Right. And the, I, I think that those employees would still be paid no, I don't because think of the public health they... crisis that we're facing. And so I think the distinction here is when those, there may be some employees that are going to be at home and could be receiving a, receiving pay, and there are going to be those that are going to be asked to either work at home, telework, or they're going to be asked to come in to man the essential services particularly the transactional services. I think that's why there's the extra leave that is afforded to right, them. Right, but I'm going to throw this back at you, Rob, okay? And I'm going to, he's going to grin over here. Um, in a lot of ways, I don't think we have a whole lot of non-essential employees. We've made this point to make sure that we keep a lean workforce. So the fact of the matter is probably 80 or 90% of the employees we have are going to be coming in at some point in time over this period of time, not altogether. Okay, we talked about that is an accurate statement. Okay, I would we talked about moving you. around. So the fact of the matter is, um, if you're working Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Jackie's working Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, then on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're at home. Yeah, you're going to get paid, but we're not. We don't. I think the chairman's right. We do, you don't need to get anything extra. And, and so I think that in the acknowledgement that we don't have a whole lot of extra people. Okay, because even the parks and rec. I mean, if, if parks are going to be open. All right, and we're going to have to increase the cleaning of the bathrooms or the playground equipment. There's going to be stuff for them to do. So I think that, um, you know, this, I know where it comes from, and it came from when, you know, if we, if we did close, like we talked about for a snow event or whatever, and we have these public safety employees that are having to come in, um, but we're, we're not in that situation. I think everybody that is here at the county is going to be doing something. They were, they're just not all going to be doing it together, and we're not going to be doing it necessarily in the same way that we've done it in the past. And I, and I think it's one-offs that we're going to have where we have child care or the issues like Commissioner Keeper brought up, and I think that you all have kind of addressed that. Obviously, we're going to try to do the teleworking as much as possible. Um, so, I mean, I, I just think that it's important to emphasize that we are not closing. We're doing limited operations, you know, irregular operations, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, so I, I, we don't have a lot of non-essential employees. Everybody, everybody that works here has something that we need them to do. Understood. I, I just wanted to make sure that we were forthright with the board that there there may be some instances where we are directing employees to go home yes. because of recommendations that come from the public health realm yes. that may not be able to be assigned a teleworking job or may not be able to be directed to come in and we still feel like we would recommend that we take care of those employees and provide them. Yeah, but and, with and I don't think anybody's saying not to that. Understood. I, I, I just wanted to make sure ones, we were being clear with But the, the ones that we do have a way for them to telework or the ones that do get to come in, um, you know, they're, if, like you said, like I said, if somebody's in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they know they're not going to be here Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. They're, and the other ones that work shifts, I mean, that's just the nature of certain jobs. Understood. So, I mean, but I know I, I think that I don't think anybody up here on the board, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I know myself personally, I have no problem if we have to send people home because of CDC recommendations or whatever. Yes, sir. No, I mean, I don't have a problem with paying them. But no, they sir. need I, to have I, the understanding I, I, that we may be calling them on a Saturday and say, we need you to come in today. You haven't been here Monday through Friday, but we need you to come in this day because yes, we have something for you to do. No, I just wanted to, I didn't mean to complicate the issue. I just wanted to make sure we were being forthright with the board to make sure the board understood what staff was recommending, sir. So then my next question is, is do we need to change the title of this policy? Because it's a you know emergency closure policy, which <laughs> makes us think we're gonna close, but should we change it to emergency conditions policy and tighten your tie? Uh, the county attorney and I were, um, and I, 
I see you, Chairman, smiling. Um, the, the county attorney and I were discussing uh, titling it differently, Commissioner, um, which I think we could tie in the limited operational services component that we've been discussing today. And uh, with the board's permission, uh, perhaps we be, if there is a motion by this board at our request, to adopt the policy perhaps as we have done in other cases, particularly code amendments, that we be allowed to make some adjustments to reflect the direction of the board as it relates to titling the document and inserting the limited operational language that I think we've discussed pretty good or pretty, we vetted very well today and that we be allowed to make those editorial changes to implement the desire of the board, sir. Today, or at a later time, Ron? Um, I, what I, Commissioner Cubitt, I, I think that if we were to have a day or two to make those particular changes, um, we could certainly get them back to the board. Um, but moving forward with the what we're recommending as for far today. as Wednesday at 12.01 a.m., we would like for the board to adopt that and give us the leeway to make the necessary editorial corrections. Adopt this or adopt? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, but be recognizing that we do need to be more specific as it relates to the closure okay. and the limited operational, uh, the limited operations that we've discussed, ma'am. And, and I think, Rob, I mean, if any commissioner, once you get the language changed, and it, you know, based on the comments from the board, um, if any commissioner sees something needs to be changed, the next time the board meets, we can make those tweaks at that time. Yes, sir. But Certainly. at least, at least I, allow you to put it in place. That's correct, sir. And, and that and staff would be fine with that understanding that things have been moving really really fast um, J Jackie was in here Saturday and Sunday and just in Saturday and Sunday we were not high-fiving because we were high elbowing but uh, we were I was congratulating Jackie and then we there was something that came out last night and Jackie called me and oh my gosh that changed from what I worked on today so we we know it's going to move quickly and certainly if the board is we we appreciate the board's support we appreciate the board allowing us to to have the flexibility and we'd it, be fine with that if there's anybody that understands how things can change hour by hour it's me with my other job because <laughs> i don't even know where the planes are going to fly <laughs> and just one other it's it's the very last one it says all non-boc employees are expected to follow the directive of their elected officials Shouldn't that be county manager or directors? Because no, it's non-BOC. Non BOC employees are the ones that are under the county manager. It, this says non-BOC. Right, non-BOC would be everybody that's or in, in a constitutional officer or another elected official. So like the superior court clerk, the judges. Uh, BOC employees are everybody that works under the county manager. Non-BOC are like, for example, Barry's here. I mean, they work in Barry's office. They work in... The Superior Court, that's all the non-BOC. Okay, but I guess that goes back to the first paragraph where we were discussing what was the elected officials. Right, but there, I mean, in that particular, I mean, I understand in the earlier ones, but in, in that particular one, everybody that is a non-BOC employee works for an elected official. The, the, there's I, The confusion okay. you said on the other ones, I get, but this one, this one's pretty clear. Okay. I, I just want to uh, emphasize to... Um, county manager, deputy, and HR, that my position is that if an employee does not need to be here to, um, to maintain uh, what is considered an essential task of county government, they should not be here, period. Um, I'm even concerned about this meeting. This is the most number of people that I've been around in a long period of time, and I'm already starting to feel some, some kind of way. I'm serious. Some of you may, seriously, maybe it's the alcohol making me dizzy from uh, cleaning my hands every five minutes, but um, if we do not need an employee coming on site to wherever their um, location of business is for county government, I do not want them to be here over the next couple of weeks, period. Sure, Commissioner Burrell. Um, the, as far as um, working from home or out in the field, going directly, like code enforcement, or are those decisions up to the department head or their supervisor? 
the recommendation comes from the department head to the county manager to approve. Okay. Okay. So you're the ultimate. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I know. You're going to extend your stay? I've tried. I really tried. Okay, any more questions on that policy, Commissioner? Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, Chairman, if, if I may, sure. um, we're going to formulate the motion. I think it would be substantially similar to the policy that we have here, but then as edited by the comments and suggestions made by the board to right. be brought back at the next meeting for final approval. Something along those lines. So what are we going to do in the meantime? No, no to be passed today, so okay. we should form the substantially similar to what we've had as edited by the comments and suggestions made by the board. Okay. Okay. All right, that's okay. But allowed to be implemented. Allowed to be, yeah. We're going to have allowed that's to be implemented, unknown. but then to be brought back to the board. Yeah, and, that, okay. and the clerk will get that note for the motion. So, Commissioner, so a week, have you got one more? No, that's that's all. all of them, yes, sir. All right. So, do you want us to approve each one of them, make a most each one individually? How do you want us to do that? Well, however, the attorney wants to do it that gets it accomplished. That's <laughs> Excuse me. I'd prefer that we, um, based upon that last instruction, that we uh, look at the uh, emergency closure uh, policy. Okay. With the phraseology that I su suggested for the board. You want a motion, Chairman? please? Yeah. All right. I make a motion that we approve the emergency closure policy in substantial conformity to what's in the agenda with the changes um, mentioned by the board and recorded by the clerk um, with the name change to the limited operational uh, what did we say no. well no services. that's what they wanted to change it to services. i just want to make sure that we don't get stuck with that name when they don't want that name Lost. okay we have a second i'll second, second it we have a second. All right, end of discussion. Call the question. Passes five to zero. Okay. Does that cover them all, Bill? No, sir. That would just be that one. No. That's what Did, I thought. Do I need the limited operational one? Yes, sir. Did I need to have in there the, to allow it to be implemented on that date, or that's separate, right? You, since it wasn't included in that first one, yes. Be allowed to be implemented that date, yes. Okay, so just add that to the motion that yes. it'll be allowed to be implemented on. Uh, March 18th at 12.01 a.m. Well, that, but that's that's separate because otherwise it's going to be in place all the time. <laughs> okay. I mean, we're, we're approving we're approving the changes to the policy. Correct. But I it would seem to me that you want to have a separate motion. Well, the policy the policy would be implemented today right. as soon as you right. passed so today. Pass. Right. That, that takes care of that. You don't have to have. Yeah, we don't. And we don't need a motion if they want to implement it on March 18th. That's something totally separate, right? Correct. That would be the county right. manager, okay. the executive officer. Right. The count. That's what the okay. Right. So the next one is, then I'll I'll make a motion that we approve the public health emergency policy as presented. Second. Discussion. Call the question. It passes five to zero. Okay. Telework. I'm looking for the other one here. The <laughs> telework. Okay. Um, and now I make a motion that we approve the teleworking policy as revised and presented. Discussion? Call a question. Passes five to zero. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, what I'd like to have is Dr. Meemark come up, uh, and Lisa also, and I'd like you to give us your latest recommendation about, you know, uh, how the COVID-19 virus is going to impact the workplace and any suggestions you might have that the board might want to consider uh, and the, also the, the county manager with regard to the, the fast-breaking chain of events. Well, um, since we've been here, I, I'm getting texted um, nonstop that now it's not uh, 50 people, but we're looking at 10. So um, you all, we've all been hanging out together for the last few hours. So um, there, it looks like the president has recommended less than ten people that to okay. congregate. So that's something to to uh, We're in think about. <laughs> so um, 
some of the things that we were very excited that you all talking about social distancing and um, and that's great. So if you've seen the um, the models and the curves out there um, and what's been happening, the um, lack of testing that is happening right now um, does not give us um, an ability to get a good picture of what is happening right now. So you know we use the evidence that we have and and what is happening throughout the nation to make a lot of these um, decisions and recommendations. And so um, being able to social Distance is one of the only weapons that we have right now to put a stop to the progression of this um, of this disease. So we really ex are excited to um, hear that. And um, a lot of your policies, um, even your uh, stay-at-home policy and, and leave, those are fantastic. Um, we are working on that ourselves and having a hard time getting those because we're a lot of our employees are under the state system, and so that makes it a little bit more difficult for us. So those are those are really good policies that we're seeing. Um, and staying at home, so making sure that everybody is understanding of that. Then. If there's any question or, um, you know, not having a lot of proof that needs to be um, provided by the employee, but uh, making sure that we um, stay at home when we are exhibiting any symptoms and are ill. Um, we talked a little bit about testing, and I did want to make sure that um, people were aware that um, this is a, a, a presidential mandate and priority right now, as well as for the state of Georgia. And so um, testing is something that is being worked on very hard um, by the state, and so Cobb and Douglas Public Health will be part of that as well. So we are really trying to help to get whatever is available, um, try to bring it to our community and help out as well in that regard. Um, one of the things that um, um, you all had talked about was um, kind of continuing essential services for the county going, and those are fantastic, but one of the things that we do want to think about is some of our vulnerable populations. I know you all um, have thought a lot about that, and so there's certain populations that um, have a little bit more trouble, and so our um, homeless populations as well as uh, patients that are mentally ill and elderly populations. So these are just some things to think about. When, when you talked about the water, um, I love that you had talked about, um, you know, um, giving some special consideration to people. But remember, in this case, um, there's no hand sanitizer out there, right? And so people need to be able to wash their hands. And so um, I would really love to have some consideration for not shutting off people's water best we can because they do need to be able to wash their hands. It's probably one of the only things that we have. So, um, But we're working very hard to... Um, um, around the clock to try to get a control of this and hope I, I was pleased and a little tired to hear our names mentioned so often but we've been <laughs> trying to trying to get um, a, a touch on everybody and to help get this message out and we've, we've tried to be ahead of it and uh, and we really we are really just thankful to the county the county has been um, ahead of the curve on this and and we know by we're on state calls and listen to other counties are, that are dealing with this and I feel like um, Cobb County um, has some of the best leaders and are ready to do whatever is necessary to um, keep this from spreading in our in our group and our community. So did you have specific questions? Yeah, one thing I'd like you to highlight is it's already out there, uh, Dr. Meemark. Mm -hmm. The state is going to implement some mobile test sites, yeah. and there's this um, um, belief that everyone is eligible to go to these test sites, when in fact, I don't think that's quite the case. So could you explain what the state is doing yeah. here in this regard? So we're preparing right now to be able to offer more sites to test. Now, this is the issue is that there are not enough test kits, and they're working very hard to increase the volume number. Um, even the ones that they are coming out with right now, it's not enough for the population. And so what they're looking at is prioritizing people that have to get tested. So the ones that we're looking at are people who need to know because they will be affecting another group of, of essential people that will provide essential services. So for example, those are health care providers. So you, we sometimes need to know if a health care provider is infected, so whether they um, can go back to work and, and continue to help people right, that, that need medical care. Other people are potentially um, in nursing homes. So you've seen what's happened in Washington state. One case can lead to a bunch of people getting infected as well as uh, quite a few deaths and that's something that we want to avoid as well. Um, so they're looking at these very high risk populations to start and there's going to be a rollout of this so it will start with whatever test kits that we get and there's it's a moving target we don't know how many yet but however we get however many we get we will do as many tests as we possibly can and so we're committed to doing that um, and eventually it will get on to surveillance when we have those millions of tests available we only 
we in our community need um, 900,000 for both Cobb and Douglas. So, but um, those when we get to that point, that is the the medium long term goal for us to be able to do that. But right now, it is going to be on just the, the highest priority so that we can try to get a handle of the disease and make sure that we're not spreading it quickly in um, in very vulnerable populations. Okay, and I think it's important to remember that look, it's going to be out there anyhow. <clears throat> The Cobb County site is going to be at the Jim Miller Park, mm -hmm. but we want to tell people don't be driving to Jim Miller Park yeah. because people who tested there are going to be have control numbers. Yeah. And unless you have a control number, you're not going to have access to the site. No, it's be pre-approved um, right. to, to be able to come because we, you know, the numbers as low as 25 to I mean, we don't know what the number is going to be, so there's no point in, in mm -hmm. waiting and and mm -hmm. not getting in if you don't have a number. Okay. All right. Any questions yes, from the member of the we board, Dr. Mark? So one more piece to add to that. So yeah. as Dr. Meemark said, the purpose of testing is to make sure that in really vulnerable populations, we are not continuing to spread it, right? But every resident in this community can do their part. The first step is truly respect the social distancing guidelines, right? The county is not limiting all of these activities, and our school system is not limiting all of this, the school uh, ag uh, congregating in order for our families to go take our children to the malls, right, and hang out. So every resident can do their part by respecting the social distancing intention, which is to stay home and, and to um, limit the number of folks that people come in contact with. So we know that's terribly burdensome, but that is what we're gonna need for folks to do in order to get on top of this. The second piece about the folks being tested is that if individuals are having mild symptoms, then even if they were tested, that their plan of care would be the same. So if I am not an essential person, like I'm not a healthcare worker serving patients in the hospital, I might not get to the point where I need to be tested in order to control the outbreak in the community but I still may have symptoms, I still may be positive, but I need to stay home and isolate myself, that wouldn't change if I were tested or not. If I, got, if, if I had symptoms of fever, shortness of breath, and coughing, and I didn't get tested or I did get tested, the recommended next step is for me to isolate at home. And so if people will do that, then that solves a lot of the issue as well. Okay. I think it's important to remember that the reason we're doing in the mitigation phase now is that we don't want to overwhelm the health facilities. Right. That is, that's what's missing in all this, is that the reason we're doing this, yes, it's bad that you get the illness, but there are a finite number of beds and doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals. And if we don't control this, then we will, we will quickly overwhelm the system. And that is going to be uh, a, you know, a, a catastrophe all in itself. Exactly. So I think that's why it's why it's important to stay home, you know, social distance and take care of that. So I, I want to commend all you're doing down there at, uh, at the public health department. You've been real on top of it. And uh, Dr. Merrick, you've become a real rock star in video. You're, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, the hits are all over the page. So you may have a future. I have a YouTube career after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate thank you coming up. The last thing I want to bring up. Uh, that we've seen an email from I'm sure all of us about the impact of businesses staying open, okay, and what what authority the board has to address that. And uh, Bill, if you address what is the only measures we may have as a board that we can do to to pre prevent businesses from opening or along those lines, the Chairman, it'd be a matter of declaring a, an emergency and then having those powers that you would be able to have at that point in time. And at this point in time. Obviously, all just decided the Cobb County government is going to stay open, so that would not be the point that you would be directing that toward at this time. So it's a it's a case by case basis. It's out there, and plus, that's that's something we wouldn't want to do. But uh, I can assure you, it would be something we wouldn't do without, without consultation with the board. Because in that case here, of the, if I understand, the chairman has the authority to declare the emergency without a necessary without, without a vote of the board, and that would be controversial in itself, knowing this board, uh, but. I uh, just want to assure everybody here that that's a last step measure, but it'll be done in close consultation to every member of this board. That would, no one will not be contacted unless if we have to take that step to get to consensus about what we have to do here. Okay, any other things from the board? 
Thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. Great, great session. Thank you very much for all you're doing. Thank you for the staff. And we're adjourned.